You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by 90 Min. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and on this edition, we're going to be rounding up the latest Arsenal-related transfer news. And of of course, again, uh, there is plenty to get into. Going to take a little bit of a slightly different direction on this one, though, right? We're still going to give you uh, the latest information with regards to a number of uh, reported targets. We're going to talk about any updates on the futures of players that could be potentially leaving the club. But what we're also going to do is we're going to focus a little bit more specifically on a player for whom the links aren't quite as strong, but a player who plays in a position that I feel like right now we're not hearing a great deal about. You know, we're talking about that attacking midfield position. Um, and, and, and I'm talking about specifically Nabil Fakir. So, We're going to go into Nabil Fakir in a little bit of detail. We're going to be talking about that number 10 position in a little bit more detail because I feel like over the last few days, everything's kind of been dominated by the Ben White stuff, the Manuel Locatelli stuff. And and for me, you know, the centre of midfield in particular is, is incredibly important and it's incredibly important that Arsenal strengthen there. But the creative midfield position is something that is also very, very important. And when you think about kind of, what we've heard and what we've listened to since the um, the, the kind of Buendia stuff ended and since Buendia uh, joined Aston Villa, it's all gone a little bit quiet on that front. You know, Martin Odegaard was alleged to be Arsenal's number one target. And by all accounts now, it doesn't look like we're going to get Martin Odegaard either. So that's a little bit of a concern for me, that, that particular area. It's an area of importance. We talk a lot about Emil Smith-Rowe and we talked a lot about Emil Smith-Rowe when Uh, Martin Odegaard was coming to the club and what that might do to him, whether it would impact his development, whether it would get in the way, whether it would prevent him fulfilling his potential. And I actually think it it did the opposite. I thought what it did was it gave Arsenal an alternative, which subsequently took some of the pressure off a very young and a relatively experienced Emil Smith-Rowe. And it almost gave him that little bit more freedom to be able to at times go and play from the left go and play from the right. I think a lot of people thought that he and Odegaard would never be in the same starting eleven, and that was proved to be wrong. They were on, on numerous occasions. So, yeah, I think um, I, I think bringing somebody in last season did Emil Smith throw the world of good because it took the pressure off him when he was injured, when he was um, sort of breaking down, which Emil Smith Rowe has done quite frequently throughout his career. Nobody was kind of... You know, and I know at times that you know you could argue that he was rushed back, uh, but nobody was kind of sitting there going, "Oh, we're completely screwed now." And and as a result of that, he was able to sort of be managed in a in a smarter way and managed in a way that works for his body um, better than he might have been had Martin Odegaard not been at the club. So, yeah, um, I want to talk about that position and let, let's kick off then. Let's let's talk about. Uh, Nabil Fakir. And Nabil Fakir is a player that Arsenal have allegedly, and this is according to a report uh, on goal um, a couple of days ago now. Well, no, not a couple of days ago. It was less than uh, 24 hours ago. Um, Mo's asking in the chat where this has come from as well. So there is a report from goal. Um, You know what? Let me just, uh, let me see if I can bring it up. Um, I was looking at it a little bit earlier on. Here it is. Here it is. So it was 20 hours ago. So it's not that long ago. Um, I've not dug out a report from six months ago and trying to pass it off as new information. Here it is. And it is just a brief mention um, of Nabil Fakir, but it does mention Nabil Fakir and it does mention that he is a player that Arsenal have been in discussions with um, or have held informal discussions, I think is the word that they use. Yep, there it is. Hussein Mouar is another possibility given Arsenal long standing interest in La in the league. Start while there have been informal discussions with the representatives 
of Nabil Fakir at Real Betis. There it is in black and white. Um, so that's over on gold.com. Normally quite good goal. You know, they've got some really, really good people working there. Charles Watts in particular, who's very reliable when it comes to Arsenal. Um, involved in that report, I'd imagine. But let's focus on Nabil Fakir, right? So we, we know from this that Arsenal have held some sort of discussion with Nabil Fakir's representatives. We don't have, a, a, you know, a report suggesting that Arsenal have actually stepped that up, that they've made a concrete offer, that a bid has been tabled or that personal terms have been offered to the player. We're not at that stage yet. But we do know that Arsenal are looking for a number 10 this season, a creative midfield player. And we do know that Nabil Fakir is someone that they've been looking at um, and that they maybe don't see as the primary target, but they see as a potential target. And that's why that interest is allegedly still there. So what's the story with Nabil Fakir? And as Matt Tomo points out in the in the chat, Nabil Fakir links, is it 2016 again? Yeah, he's a player we've been linked with quite heavily in the past. And he's a player who's been linked with a move to the Premier League quite heavily in the past. He came closest to joining Liverpool, if you remember, back in 2019. And Liverpool, at the last minute, decided to pull out of the deal. And there was a lot of speculation around why that was. Um, sources inside Liverpool or, or sources that were reporting on Liverpool at the time claimed that there had been um, something that showed up in the medical with regards to a knee problem that worried Liverpool. Um, they also suggested that uh, family members, so Nabil Fakir's family members, um, who were involved in the no negotiations were making it very difficult for a deal to get done and for a deal to move forward. Nabil Fakir has vehemently denied this. He says uh, that Liverpool changed their minds because they identified a different target, decided against spending the money and used this stuff as an excuse. And he was really upset and angry about it because, of course, if you're about to sign for a high profile club and all of a sudden, people start talking about you as having an injury that could potentially uh, be a major problem. That really damages your prospects of going elsewhere. And we're talking about Anabil Fakir, who was linked with some of the biggest clubs in Europe. And with all due respect to Real Betis, where he's currently and where he ended up, Nabil Fakir was tipped for bigger things than that. So you can understand um, how Nabil Fakir maybe feels that that... Um, that whole saga involving Liverpool has led to him kind of moving out of the spotlight a little bit and actually led to him joining a, a lesser club than potentially he might have done. Um, so, you know, it's, it's an interesting story. Um, his recent sort of record is is pretty decent. Um, as I say, he's had a couple of seasons in La Liga. Now, the first season, 2019, 2020, made 32 appearances in the Spanish top flight. And, uh, turned in a really respectable seven goals and seven assists, so 14 direct goal contributions in 32 games. It's just less than one sort of direct goal contribution in every couple of games, which is kind of what you're looking for from a creative attacking midfielder. I think it reads pretty well. And last season, 33 appearances, five goals, slightly less, and uh, six assists, so just the one assist less and two goals less. Uh, but still, a very decent season for Nabil Fakir. What's appealing about Nabil Fakir that I think maybe makes him stand out from some of the other number 10 options that we've kind of heard uh, mentioned throughout this process is that Nabil Fakir is quite versatile along that front line. He can play in that central attacking midfield position. He can also play from the right or the left or just in that hole, like literally right behind the strikers, almost like a second striker. And I think that will appeal to Mikel Arteta because what we, we're needing to see uh, from Arsenal is, is a, an ability to be able to chop and change things in that front line to bring the kind of fluidity that sometimes is necessary to unlock stubborn defences. If you don't have that fluidity in your movement, if you don't have that um, the ability to kind of adapt in game, you know, identify maybe certain defenders that you feel uh, are weak links and be able to go and pin certain players on them. And that means subsequently shifting around the rest of the front line. I think I think that's a big appeal. But is, is Nabil Fakir my first choice? No, he's not. Um, and, you know, there's a number of reasons for this. I mentioned the Liverpool saga. Was there something in that? I can't hand on my heart say that Liverpool 
identified an injury that was going to cause whoever ended up paying for Nabil Fakir or whoever or, or posed a risk to anybody making a significant investment in him. Um, so I can't handle my heart say that's true. You know, Nabil Fakir is someone who's been quite outspoken, who's been involved in kind of a number of fallings out. And that does worry me. That does concern me. I don't like that sort of thing. Um, and I don't think based on what we've seen so far from Mikel Arteta, he's a big fan of that either. Liam Rushworth in the chat has just put a comment in, which I think is 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 really spot on, actually. It's a weird one because Fakir isn't someone I want, but I can't think of any other options we can get. Now, this is the thing. And this is why when I when I read this report this morning and I was thinking about it, I decided to kind of base the, the sort of beginning of the show around it and to home in on this particular element because we're talking about Nabil Fakir because he's a name that's been mentioned. We all know that Arsenal wanted Martin Odegaard. We all know that Martin Odegaard was the primary target. He was the one that Arsenal wanted. I think we all know that. The problem is, is that that is looking increasingly unlikely and with Emi Buendia, who was a, a lot of people's first choice, having joined Aston Villa, coupled with what's going on with Martin Odegaard, you're starting to get into a bit of a place now where you're going, well, what else is there? Who else is there? And it feels like we're kind of recycling the same old names. Nabil Fakir, though, remains a target. You know, how high up the list he is is unclear. Um, but a number of, of reliable sources are reporting that he is someone that is under consideration. Another player under consideration, under huge consideration, or that the club are said to be big admirers of, is James Madison. But again, finances are going to make that one difficult. They're going to make that one a very difficult deal to do. And is it a case of Arsenal having the finances? Maybe we do. But even if we do have 70, 75 million pounds to be able to throw at a creative midfield player, I'm not sure that James Madison is worth that. I've got to be honest. That's my that's my honest opinion. Um, Jay Dubia in the chat mentioned uh, Sabitza. Can't Sabitza also play as a 10? I think Sabitza could, could probably do a job there. I, I see Sabitza as the kind of player that would fit into more like a, a Liverpool midfield where it, it is a 4-3-3. So it is a three-man midfield and not a two-man midfield sort of deeper line pivot and then a creative specialist attacking midfield player. But I wonder if Mikel Arteta might see that as the future. And if he does, then yeah, you know, Marcel Sabitzer would be a good fit. And we know that he's going to be available uh, on a cut price deal this summer because of his contract situation at RB Leipzig. So he's an option as well. But the, the point is, and the point why I've kind of gone back to Nabil Fakir and why I'm, I'm even discussing him is because Options are limited, you know, at this moment in time. When you look at the players that Arsenal have been credibly linked with sort of over the last few months with regards to an attacking midfielder, it is, um, it is for me, you know, it is getting a little bit kind of, you're getting a little bit sort of worried about where we go from here. Now, what we've seen in the past is Arsenal go bang and sign a player that none of us even knew they were in for. And I'm kind of sitting here hoping that's the case and hoping that's going to happen in the coming weeks because I'm, I'm talking about Nabil Fakir and I, and I do think Nabil Fakir is a decent footballer. Um, but am I sitting here talking about Nabil Fakir with the kind of enthusiasm I was talking about Manuel Locatelli with just a, a, a day or so ago? No, I'm not. Um, it's a signing that I'm kind of halfway there on, but not fully there. Um, and, and I want to stress the point, you know, that this is something that Arsenal have in mind. It is something that Arsenal have held informal discussions about, but it's not something Arsenal have moved forward on. It's not something Arsenal have taken to that next level. So don't be sort of fooled by the title of the episode or or the fact that I started by Nabil Fakir into thinking that I am suggesting this is further down the line. I'm not. I've, I've picked Nabil Fakir because he is one that the link just doesn't go away for. Um, and, and at a time where we kind of, our other options appear to be being exhausted, appear to be one by one sort of diminishing 
then it's interesting that he's still one of the names that is is being reported. Just going back to that point about the 4-3-3, uh, Gianfranco says Arteta has mentioned he wants to move to a 4-3-3. Yeah, I think he has mentioned it um, in the past. I just wonder if, you know, Mikel Arteta's plans may have changed. And, you know, I think that when you want to particularly get your fullbacks going forward the way that, that Mikel Arteta likes, and when you look at the fact that we're not a Manchester City, um, you know, and we're not a Liverpool either, who have a Mo Salah and Sadio Mane wingers who contribute incredible, va- incredibly vast amounts of goals. I think it's important that your fullbacks get forward in in a in order to un- unlock teams, and I think you can only really allow them to do that, you know, with complete freedom. If you've got that two-man midfield pivot, I like the idea of a two-man midfield pivot. Four-two-three-one is currently my favourite formation, but whether Arteta will stick with that, I don't know. And if Arteta does see that as the formation, then going back to that point I made a, a minute or so ago, Marcel Sabitza does feel like a good fit. You're right. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, Vladimir Soskic says, if I throw money like 50 million for white, then many midfielders in Europe are available. Good point. Uh, Robin says, Harry, what about a wild number one target last summer? And now he's cheaper, but we don't seem to hear that much about him. Yeah. Hussein Awa is another player um, that the links to him are just not going away. But Hussein Awa is not a, an attacking midfield player as such. He is a central midfield player. So again, I go back to that point. If you're talking about Arsenal moving to a 4-3-3, um, settling on a system whereby we are playing with more of a flat midfield three than what we're currently doing, which is, as I say, playing with that two-man pivot and the one player in front, then yeah, Hussein Awa seems like a good option. And that's why it seemed like it was Hussein Awa or, or it was Hussein Awa or Thomas Partey last season and not both partly due to finance, but partly due to, um, you know, what they are as players and the positions that they were going to take up moving forward. So interesting, uh, interesting stuff. Hussein Awa for me, I was never that big on Hussein Awa, not even last summer. If you remember, if you were a viewer or a listener back then, you'll remember me sort of saying that I wanted Thomas Partey over Hussein Awa. And I, and I was saying that all along. Um, and I've not seen a great deal from Hussein Awa this season to suggest that, you know, I was wrong in that. Um, bagged a few goals for Lyon, seven uh, in the French Liga and in 30 appearances, which is quite respectable for someone who, as I say, isn't a specialist attacking midfielder. Um, and, you know, we could do with a few more goals from from the rest of our midfielders. There's no doubt about that. We could do with a few more goals from everybody outside of, uh, Pierre Emerick Aubameyang, Alexander Lacazette, and, and Nicola Pepe. So you know goals are always welcome, but I don't know about a while. You know it depends on the price. It depends on the price. With a lot of these players, that's how I feel. And again, you know I've got to stop doing it. I know that it's a terrible habit where I kind of go down this. Well, is it value for money? Well, is it my money? No, it's not. And really, should I give a shit if it's value for money? Probably not. But I do. I can't help it. Can't help it. Uh, what else have we got in here? Um, just kind of sticking with the formation theme because we've kind of drifted towards that. Uh, Carrie says, could Arsenal play three at the back, Saliba, White and Gabriel? Um, I'll be surprised if Mikel Arteta changes our go-to formation to one that incorporates three centre-backs. I think it's something he likes to have up his sleeve for certain games against certain opponents. And I think it is something that is good to have up your sleeve. I think it's good to be adaptable. It's good to be able to change things. Um, but you always need a plan A. And I, and I don't see the back three as being plan A. I could be wrong, but, you know, for me, it's not the it's not the way I would go. Um, but I wouldn't rule it out, Karen. It's an interesting point. And, you know, I think we're going to learn a lot at the start of the season, maybe about what Mikel Arteta's intentions are going to be moving forward. Um, has what happened at the back end of last season and the summer and the recruitment that he's been able to do or that he will be able to do or isn't able to do, will that lead to a shift in strategy or will he remain with the 
4-2-3-1 that saw us actually perform relatively well in comparison to how we started the campaign uh, in the second half of the season. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Jay says, uh, don't you think it's odd that people have been saying number 10 players have died out, but we could really do with one? Yeah. Um, I don't think they've died out. I think it's great to have number 10s now, though, that can play on the right, can play on the left and can play in the middle. I think that's important um, because I think it's it's become more important now than ever to to have fluidity in your front line for people to be able to interchange positions to create spaces to pull others out of position and create room for others to exploit. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, is, it, is, it is a good point, Jay. Thank you. Um, Zeb says, who's your ideal number 10 for us to sign? Oh, my ideal number 10 is somebody like Kevin bloody De Bruyne, but we're not living in that world. Um, you know, we're, that is me kind of living in dreamland. I'm a massive fan of, of Kevin De Bruyne and I'm a massive fan of the fluidity that Kevin De Bruyne's game has to it. I keep using that word today. And the reason I use that word is because I like the fact he he can drop a lot deeper and get on the ball and make things happen. But when he does drop that bit deeper, he is dropping as an extra man, not with the responsibility of defending. And that's what I want my number 10 to do. I, I want my number 10 to have complete and utter free reign. And the only way you can do that, in my opinion, is in the 4-2-3-1. And that's why when I sit and I read comments and I hear what you guys are saying about different formations and different systems that Arsenal might play. It's why I always go back to that one, because what that does is it gives you that midfield stability to be able to say to somebody, you know, tasked with playing in the number 10 role, here you go, mate, do what you want. And, th and that's what I want from a number 10. I don't think a number 10 can be a number 10, a proper number 10 can be fully uh, creative can use their creative potential if they're tied down to a position um, all the time. And that's why I like that, that sort of style of player that can drift from the left to the right. It's what I like a lot about Emil Smith Rowe. You know, Emil Smith Rowe has, when he's played that role, dropped into the midfield to help out, but also gone out to the left and linked up with Kieran Tierney or whoever is playing on that flank, but also can go out to the right and link up with Saka or Pepe. I, I need my number 10 to, to do that, to be able to have the license to do that. And if you take that license away, then they're not really a number 10 anymore. They're just a standard central midfield player. And for me, um, that is a, that is a problem. Uh, Christian Hoover says uh, all the momentum and excitement for this window takes a big dip if we sign Nabil Fakir, horrible central attacking midfield signing, rather have Emil Smith Rowe in the 10 than this Fakir dude. Yeah, I, look, I, I wouldn't sign Nabil Fakir to replace Emil Smith Rowe. I probably wouldn't even sign Nabil Fakir when I weigh up everything um, in terms of what it will cost, what I think about him, what I like about him, what I dislike about him. For me, as I keep saying, Nabil Fakir, though, is a name that isn't going away. And it is a name that sources at Arsenal have indicated is on their list, is someone that they're keeping their eye on. How high up that list of priorities Nabil Fakir is exactly remains unclear. But he is somebody that the club are thinking about. Uh, what else have we got here? Let's see uh, what else is going on in the live chat box. Um, Damien Kelly says... Um, Madison is the one we need. Sanchez, you can play on the left side of the midfield. Um, Liam says, that, would you rather have Awa or Fakir if you aren't that high on that either? I'd probably go with Awa just because he's younger and I think he's got a higher ceiling. Um, but then that still doesn't really solve the problem, does it? it? Of that, of bringing in that attacking midfield player because Awa, as you said, listen, Awa for me suits Liverpool. That three-man midfield that Liverpool or Man City play, Hussein Awar would be a good part of that. If Arsenal are planning to change it and go down that route, then great, do it, bring him in. But Hussein Awar for me is not a deep-lying midfield player and he's not an attacking midfield player. He is a central midfield player. And that's where I think it's really important that Arsenal buy players of the right profile. But where, you know, and, and I've defended Mikel Arteta a lot, 
right? Since he took the job, you you guys will know that. But where I do get a little bit frustrated is the constant chopping and changing because I do think if you want to bring in, uh, if you want to to sign right, if you want to be smart about your recruitment, if you want to do your recruitment well then you can only really do that recruitment well when you know what kind of profile player you're looking for, when you understand what it is you're looking for. You, you go into a shop looking for a pair of running shoes and you come out with a pair of Timberland boots. You know, it's, it's pointless, isn't it? You went in there for something, go and get it. But unless you're clear in your mind what it is you're looking for, then there is a danger. Um that you get that recruitment wrong and that you buy for the sake of it, or you were kind of sucked in by other elements. And all of a sudden you're left with a player who you might like, but doesn't necessarily fit the puzzle as you'd want him to. Uh, a couple of you mentioned in the uh, Ben White stuff. We'll, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Let me just say a, a few more hellos. Let's say a big hello to Mo, to uh, J- Jonathan, to Matt, to Nicholas, um, I hope you guys are all well. Let's say a big hello to Jay as well, who's just become a YouTube member. Jay, thank you so much, mate, uh, for signing up. Really, really appreciate it. If you'd like to become a member of the channel and support me to bring you more content, and we are stepping it up, well, we have stepped it up over the last few days. You'll notice by the number of content uh, going out, then please uh, do click on the link in the description. Check out our membership proposal. See if any of those tiers of membership uh, suit you. And if you'd like to sign up, you can do so uh, following that link. So, uh, Jay, thank you, and uh, look forward to seeing more of you join as well. Uh, Jay, where where is it? Jay said, uh, did it, did it. "It's taken me long enough, but joined up now, mate. Thank you very much, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, you got to be sure, right? You got to be sure." <laughs> uh, big thank you to Said Abdullah for his uh, very kind super chat. No comment on it, um, but Said, thank you so much, mate. Really appreciate it. Uh, moving on. Um, Sam Tonks, big hello to Sam Tonks, one of our existing members. He says, morning, Harry, great content as per. I'd love us to sign one of Locatelli, Sanchez, Matters, and then promote Miguel Aziz and give Ainsley Maitland-Niles a chance in midfield. But we need a new midfield option. I agree with a lot of that, Sam. I'm not sure about Ainsley Maitland-Niles, man. I just, I, I can't seem to, I can't seem to put my faith in Ainsley Maitland-Niles. I, I just can't do it partly because of what I see of him as a footballer and partly because of what I see of him as a character. I just, I really get irritated by stuff like the constant whinging about his position. Um, The reality is that Ainsley Maitland-Niles would never have got the opportunities he got at Arsenal and would probably have been like many other players who were on the peripheries of the first team and never really made that breakthrough at a club like Arsenal. Ainsley Maitland-Niles would have been there had it not been for Arsenal having a need in a different position and sort of looking at him and, and identifying him as the man to fill that position or as the man best equipped to to try and adapt. The constant complaining about it irritated me. Um, and then the decision to join West Brom over some of the other clubs who were interested because he was so desperate to play in centre midfield, when actually the West Brom move I thought was dreadful for his career, um, is another example of a player who I'm not quite sure is is on the right level for us. You know, I just take Bukayo, Bukayo Saka as a prime example of this. Look at Bukayo Saka. Broke into the Arsenal side, playing where? As a left back. He's not a left back. The guy's a right winger. But he got on with the job. He, he got his head down. He got on with it. He kept his mouth shut. He played the position. He learned the position. He did very, very well. And that earned him favour in the eyes of the managers, of the coaching staff, in the eyes of his teammates. And then he was eventually given the opportunities to play in the positions that he wants. And now he's thriving. And we all know um, how well Bukayo Saka did last season and how much, as a fan base, we we all adore him. Ainsley Maitland-Niles was the opposite. You know, yes, I know he played a lot more games than Saka did out of position. But just be grateful that you're a 20, 21-year-old lad who has been handed an opportunity to break through at a massive football club. Even if it is a bit of a foreign position, you just be grateful for where you are and you get on with it because whenever he's played in midfield for me, he's never shown enough and, and he's gone out on loan to West Brom. And again, I I talk about that being the wrong decision. It absolutely was the wrong decision to go and play for a side who 
don't play with the midfield because they just literally bypass the ball over the top of them every two minutes. It, it just was wrong for me. And um, and off the back of that, coupled with what I've seen from Maitland, I was I can't I can't really get on board with the idea of of him being um you know be him being like a, a massive sort of part of our plans next season. I, I really can't if I'm honest. Uh, let me pick out a couple more questions and then we'll move on to quickly talk about the Ben White stuff and a bit of an update on Manuel Locatelli as well. Speaking of Locatelli, Nicholas Walsh says, as someone who isn't a fan of Granite Xhaka, how much of an upgrade is Locatelli? I get very frustrated by Xhaka's poor athleticism. And while Locatelli has been good at the Euros, is he quick enough? Um, he's quicker along the ground than Granite Xhaka, right? And he's a lot more aggressive in the way he presses opponents than Granite Xhaka. Is he Golo and Golo Kante levels of mobility? No, he's not. Um, he's not, but that's not what Manuel Locatelli is. And that's not what I would want from Manuel Locatelli coming into the team. I want Mac Manuel Locatelli to do kind of a similar role to Granit Xhaka in that I want him to protect the defence. I want him to sort of clean up that space sort of in between the width of the two centre-halves to drop into positions when our fullbacks bomb on, to be able to set the tempo from deep, to receive the ball from centre-backs, move it forward, move it left, move it right, keep us ticking and, and set that tempo. That's what I want uh, from Manuel Locatelli. Granit Xhaka took a lot of stick um, last season and the seasons before that. Last season, he was excellent, I thought. He was Arsenal's most consistent performer over the course of the entire season. He was very rarely unavailable, and always did a good job, in my opinion. Made a couple of mistakes, as all players do. Um, and of course, we, we, when it's Granite Xhaka, those mistakes become, you know, blown out of proportion and become World War Free. But the point I'm trying to make is that I actually thought the balance of our side from a defensive standpoint in that midfield area was quite good. And, and that was because Granite Xhaka was very positionally disciplined and tactically disciplined. You didn't see Granite Xhaka bombing on and leaving gaping holes behind him. He was very aware of what was going on around him and the holes and the spaces that he needed to fill in. And I want to give Mikel Arteta credit for that because I think Mikel Arteta, as a midfield player who joined the Arsenal, um, having played quite a bit on the right for Everton and then a little bit in centre midfield, but was primarily known for his sort of attacking capabilities, joined the club and by Arsene Wenger was almost pushed back into this deeper line position. And nobody will know better than Mikel Arteta, maybe Granit Xhaka, but nobody else uh, will know better than, than Mikel Arteta, how frustrating it can be to, to be in that position, to have both your fullbacks bombing on, to be left completely exposed and to have your shortcomings, which Arteta's, I think, were similar to Xhaka's in that he wasn't very quick across the ground and he wasn't able to kind of swallow up ground when people were progressing against us and we were having to deal with transitions. So I think Arteta knew that. Arteta knows that. Arteta's been there, done that, experienced that, and at times was made a scapegoat during his playing days with Arsenal for being exposed on the break. And I think one of the first things that he did and one of the things he did best or has done best since he's come is be able to stop that happening as often to whoever it is charged with playing in that deepest lying midfield role. And that has seen Granit Xhaka improve. I trust now that Mikel Arteta understands what the right balance is in the midfield from a defensive standpoint. But what he needs now is to be able to translate that into a midfield that is as defensively solid as we've seen, but is also able to be a little bit more progressive and to set the tempo from earlier on in moves so that when we do get to the final 30, it hasn't taken us 30 passes. And in the in the meantime, which our opponents have parked everybody behind the ball and we can't get anywhere. So that's why I think Locatelli would be an upgrade on Xhaka because he gives you that little bit more uh, in terms of the tempo setting, in terms of the moving the ball, and in terms of an intensity that we've seen the Italian team at the Euros play with. Um, you know, and a lot of people have been sort of impressed and taken aback by that because it's not a style of play you normally associate with Italy. But for Locatelli to have been a part of that midfield and been involved in it suggests that 
you know, he's able to play that role. How much of an upgrade is he? He is an upgrade. Is it the biggest upgrade in the world? No, it's not. Um, but I don't think there are that many huge upgrades. I don't think that there are that many huge upgrades that are affordable. I think that Granite Xhaka is probably about here. Manuel Locatelli is about here. But public opinion would suggest that Granite Xhaka is down here, which makes this seem like it's a massive thing. And it's not. There isn't... There is a difference, of course, and if there wasn't a difference, I wouldn't be an advocate of us selling Granite Xhaka to replace him and bring in someone else. But the difference isn't as stark and as contrasting as, as some people might think, which is my point. Why I keep saying selling Xhaka for less than 20 million euros is bad business is because, look, to get that upgrade, to get Manuel Locatelli, you're going to have to essentially pay probably double the money. So that's why selling Xhaka for me is not is not good business. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to see an upgrade coming, but it has to be an upgrade. Manuel Locatelli for me is an upgrade, but don't go and bring me someone who is second rate and then try and pass that off as an upgrade because I'll be really disappointed in that. I really would. Let's, uh, let's move on. Um, I'm going to just put a pin in the questions, uh, for a couple of minutes. Cause there's a couple of updates that I want to, uh, bring you guys, uh, with regards to Ben White and with regards to the Manuel Locatelli situations. But if you've got questions, start chucking them in the chat now and uh, put the queue in at the beginning and I'll be able to uh, pick those out nice and easily. But just a couple of bits. Uh, let's start with the Ben White stuff. Now, a lot of Arsenal fans would have been panicking last night when they started reading reports that Everton had entered the race for Ben White. Now, I think Ben White is a player that a lot of people are interested in, and rightly so. He's shown himself to be a really progressive centre-half, a really modern centre-half, a really competent centre-half, and um, and one that would be a good addition to the football club. We know that he's going to cost a lot of money. We always talk about that Premier League premium, that Premier League tax, if you like. And Ben White is certainly someone for whom you're going to have to pay that little bit extra on top. Now, Reports came out, as I say, uh, last night. So that was on Thursday night, suggesting that Everton, um, you know, had, had spoken to Brighton and had made Brighton aware that they were willing to pay more than Arsenal, that they were willing to go that extra mile in order to to take Ben White away from Brighton and Hove Albion and bring him to Merseyside. Now, of course, Rafa Benitez has just been appointed the Everton boss, and it's alleged that Rafa Benitez is a massive, massive fan of Ben White. So what are the specifics of this? So Arsenal at the moment are kind of deadlocked with Brighton over this Ben White fee. Now we've heard reports uh, repeatedly suggesting that the clubs are not far away. And I believe that is a case is the case. And I think once England's participation and Ben White's participation in the European championships is concluded, we'll probably see a coming together and we'll see a, a decision made. Um, on Ben White, and I think the agreement will be reached. So Arsenal, as it stands, from what I know, are willing to pay £45 million pounds for Ben White, plus £5 million pounds in add-ons, which takes the total value of the deal up to around about £50 million. Pounds. Now, the reports that emerged last night claim that Everton have told Brighton they will pay £50 million pounds up front with around about £5 million pounds worth of add-ons, meaning that the value of their total proposal is around about £5 million more than that that has been tabled by Arsenal so far. However, the player will have a part to say in this as well, because you can agree the fee, but if the player then doesn't agree the move, then the move doesn't get completed. It doesn't happen. So Ben White can, in my opinion, if he prefers to join Arsenal over Everton, and why wouldn't you, uh, then you should be. Um, you know, you should be sort of making that very clear to Brighton and Hove Albion. I'm not worried about this at this stage. I still think it's going to be done. I still think Arsenal will get it done. Um, I still think that, you know, what Arsenal have offered is fair. And I think that given Arsenal have gone so big on Ben White, if they are asked to just push a little bit more uh, to, to get that deal done, if they're asked to just stretch themselves uh, that slight bit further, that they will do it. Um, that's my opinion. So uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, moving on to Manuel Locatelli, the, the situation around that one is is quite up in the air. Um, Juve 
from all accounts from Italy are working very, very hard behind the scenes at the moment to try and come up with a proposal that will satisfy what Sassuolo want. Now, remember, Juve financially are in a spot of bother. Juve are not uh, in a position to be able to pay around about 40 million, which is what uh, Sassuolo are rumoured to want for Locatelli up front. They're talking about potential loan deals with obligations to buy him further down the line. They're talking about um, payment structures, uh, something that we as Arsenal fans know all about. They're talking about cash plus player swap deals. And that's why this one's up in the air. Now, Arsenal have expressed their interest in, in uh, Locatelli. Sassuolo claim a formal offer was made. Sources at Arsenal claim that a formal offer was never made, but discussions, initial discussions did take place. They didn't deny the interest in Locatelli, but they refused to be drawn on the fact that they'd made a full and formal offer. So we don't really know what the situation is. All we know is that Arsenal are interested and that's that, right? How sort of far down the line that is, how far they've taken that in terms of the conversations is unclear. But it seems to me right now that Juve still remain in the driving seat with regards to Locatelli. Because just like I was talking about with Ben White, Manuel Locatelli would prefer to stay in Italy and would prefer to join Juventus. So Arsenal are playing a bit of a waiting game now. Arsenal are there in the background. Arsenal are watching this situation with, uh, with interest and Arsenal will be waiting to pounce if a deal cannot be done with Juventus. But from what I understand, Juve are leading the race for this one. I said yesterday, don't get too carried away with it. Um, and I'm not ruling it out either because there is a very good chance that Juventus don't find a solution that satisfies Sassuolo. And therefore, the door could be open for Arsenal to swoop in and uh, and, and take him away. But let's see. Uh, big game for Italy tonight, of course. Uh, Manuel Locatelli expected to be involved, of course, as Italy take on Belgium in the Euro 2020 quarterfinals. And we're going to be bringing you our Euro 2020 podcast tomorrow morning where we'll be reviewing the two games today. So Switzerland versus Spain and, of course, Italy versus Belgium. Come on, Italy. Um, so those are the, the two uh, updates. Uh, elsewhere, The Athletic uh, just recently have put out a piece that claims that uh, Aston Villa remain focused on prizing Emil Smith-Rowe away from Arsenal. How far will they go in terms of their offer? Who knows? But that is a player I desperately do not want to see Arsenal selling. Um, I really don't. I'd be really disappointed in the club if they were to do that. Um, still waiting for the Messi reports to pop up. Uh, Lionel Messi, officially a free agent, although I do expect him to probably sign a new contract with Barcelona. Um, yeah, still not seen uh, that many pictures of him on social media in a in a photoshopped arsenal shirt and all of that so uh yeah <laughs> uh watch this space i'm sure that one is coming as well right get your questions in uh for the last sort of 10 minutes or so let's pick up as many questions as we possibly can don't forget to hit the like button uh, on the video if you haven't done so already let me just uh quickly uh check in um where we're at in terms of likes because i i actually hate asking for likes it it, it bothers me it irritates me that um that I do it, but I, I need to do it because it really helps the channel. And obviously I want the channel to, to grow and to progress. And I can see there's over 200 of you watching us live at the moment, but there are only 46 likes. Come on guys should be easy as pie to get that up to a hundred, uh, based on how many of you are watching at this moment in time. So please do uh, hit that button. It really, really does help. Um, da -da 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 -da. uh, Matt G says that uh, why can Man United get the Sancho deal done? while he's at the Euros, but we can't get the Ben White deal done. So I think these two situations are, are quite different. And I'll explain why. So from what I've sort of been told and from what we kind of, you know, look, I'm not claiming to be in the know here. Please don't take this that way. But what happens in the world of football journalism, um, and I'm saying this because not to be disrespectful, but I, maybe people don't realise sometimes how some of this stuff works. What will happen is a media outlet, let's use 90 Min as the example, will have sources, people attached to certain clubs, people who, um, who, you know, have contacts, who 
literally work as sources and basically gather information before selling it on to media outlets right um so there are people out there that do that believe me it's a bit of a sh it sounds like a bit of a shady profession but there are people that do that so from what was kind of told to me and from what i was briefed on the sancho thing um by a source manchester united and jane sancho had agreed the the deal and had agreed the terms for his transfer to manchester united last year Jaden Sancho wanted to join Manchester United from last year. That was all agreed. There was never any doubt about it, never any questions about it. Whilst Manchester United last season were trying to strike a deal with Borussia Dortmund, which they were unable to do, as we know now, negotiations took place between Manchester United and Jaden Sancho's representatives. And the outcome of those negotiations was that salary, signing on fees, bonuses, um, whatever else is included in contracts were already determined and decided. So this summer, it's literally just been about agreeing a fee with Borussia Dortmund. So Jaden Sancho, you know, Dortmund have agreed, uh, have announced that that deal is, is going to go through and that, that, that the agreement is in place. You'll see Jaden Sancho pictured in his United shirt and all of that officially, I'm sure when the Euros finish. But the point is that with Ben White, Arsenal were never that far down the line. Uh, going into the competition and that's why there are still things to be done also Arsenal haven't agreed a fee with Brighton yet but Man United already had done half of the job by uh, agreeing everything with um with um with Jaden Sancho in advance uh let's pick out a few uh more questions uh Syed says that do you think our problem in scoring goals is because of wasting chances or creating small amounts of chances. And do you think we need a striker? I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think we did waste a lot of chances last season, more so than I can remember Arsenal doing in years gone by. Do we need to create more chances? We absolutely do. There were performances where we created tons of chances, never took them and ended up suffering poor results. Um, and, and they were hard to take. There were e equally performances where we struggled to break teams down just because we didn't create hardly anything. So it is a bit of both. Do I think we need a striker? I think in the longer term we do. Um, and I, you know, I, I genuinely believe that. But right now, what's it going to cost to improve on Lacazette? I'd argue in excess of 50 million. What's it going to cost to improve on Aubameyang? I'd argue the same. Are they priorities for me right now? No, I think they both stay at the club. I think they're both still good enough. Um, and I think you, you look at improving us in other areas. And off the back of that, those two uh, will flourish. Uh, what else have we got? Um, Liam says, do you think Arsenal won't go for Bissouma because of the nationality, because of the African Cup of Nations? I don't want to say this um, with certainty because I'm not certain about it. This is just me guessing. This is me speculating. I think that that may play a part. I think that that has played a part for a long time now. Uh, with a number of clubs, not just Arsenal, when it comes to recruiting African players, the timing of the African Nations tournament, which is slap bang in the middle of the season, which isn't the case for the Copa America, isn't the case for the World Cup, isn't the case for the Euros um, normally, is it, it has made clubs think twice, I think, over the years about signing African players from fear of losing them for that month. Uh, and it's a crucial month. You know, you're talking about the month normally just after Christmas. So it's heading into the business end of the season. I do think it plays a part. Do I think that that's why Arsenal aren't going for Bissouma, though specifically? No. I think that Yves Bissouma, as I've said before, is just not the profile of player that Arsenal are looking for in that position. Some will argue that's exactly the type of player that we need. And I'm happy to entertain that argument because I think there's a good case for it. But in my opinion, he is looking for a Granite Xhaka type player. He is looking for a midfield controller rather than a midfield enforcer. That's what I think. Um, and, and so that's why I think that Bissouma is not, is not being uh, pursued at this moment as a priority. Will that change uh, later down the line? Maybe, uh, maybe. But at this moment in time, I don't think he's the priority. I really don't. Uh, big hello to Daniel, who joins us from Singapore. He says, I enjoy your podcast. Well done. Keep it up. 
Daniel, thank you so much, mate. I really appreciate it. Um, really, really does help. Big hello to Simranjit Singh as well, one of our members. Uh, Jack says, thoughts on Matthias Pereira? Um, decent player. Arsenal player? Not sure, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, was a bright spark in a very um, poor West Brom side, I thought, last season. I I don't know. Uh, you know, again, it's one of those ones, isn't it, where it depends on what they're asking for. 11 goals in 33 appearances last season in the Premier League, as I say, for a poor West Brom side is very, um, very respectable. And um, yeah, decent player, but not the priority for me, not someone I'd be pursued as a priority anyway. Jan Franco says that Harry just saw that we are linked with James Tavernier for the right back position. Any truth in this? Read this report as well. Um, my personal view on it, again, it's a personal view, is no, um, I don't think so. I think what we've, we're seeing from Arsenal at the moment is a clear shift in the transfer policy. And, you know, we've talked in the in years gone by about signing players for big amounts of money who, by the time they reached the end of their initial contract, were worthless. And I think Arsenal are trying to avoid that situation. Again, I think you can see that in the type of players we're going after. You're looking at Albert Laconga, who we expect to join in the coming weeks. Young player with the potential to develop who potentially holds a sell-on value. You look at uh, Nuno Tavares, who's very, very close to joining Arsenal now. Understand a medical took place in Portugal yesterday um, and that he will be travelling to London to, to finalise everything. Nuno Tavares, again, very young, potential to develop, potential to hold on his sell-on value. Ben White, if we do get him, another one. Manuel Locatelli, too. I think that Arsenal have shifted their transfer strategy. I really do. And I don't believe that somebody like James Tavernier... Um, is is someone we we should be looking at is he a good right back he's a decent right back um you know had a good season up in scotland but we're talking about up in scotland i don't mean that disrespectfully but it is not the same level as the premier league you know it, it just isn't what tavernia brings to the table that a lot of fullbacks don't is he brings a lot of goals and he brings a lot of assists i mean you look at his record in the scottish premiership 33 goals and 47 assists in 155 appearances that's remarkable for a fullback to have that kind of impact in the attacking third of the pitch but he's 29 years old i think if i'm not mistaken let me just double check that yeah 29 years old would probably be available at a relatively cheap price but not one for the future for me and not a long-term investment. And I'm not sure Arsenal are going to be making too many more of those sort of stopgap signings over the coming months. I think that was to try and get us by. It worked in some cases. It didn't work in others. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to leave it at that on that one. I, I don't think there's, there's much truth in that. Although you're right to point it out because there are multiple reports now uh, suggesting that's the case. I just don't think he fits in what we're trying to do at the moment. Um, so, yeah. Right. I am going to leave it there uh, because uh got a dash, but um, great chatting to everyone as always. And thank you all so much for the brilliant interaction in the live comments. When you're doing a podcast by yourself, um, which has its challenges, it's, um, it's so much easier when you've got that incredible interaction in the chat box to kind of bounce off of and to, to use to kind of uh, spark discussion. So it's it's amazing. So thank you all uh, for constantly being in the chat box, for constantly interacting, uh, for calling me out when you disagree, for letting me know when you agree um, and, and for always being here. So thank you all so much. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Um, if you're listening via the audio platform, please do leave us a review. It really, really helps. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you're new. I'll be back tomorrow now. Um, we only do one podcast on a Friday, uh, but we'll be back tomorrow with our Euro 2020 daily. Uh, so I'll be uh, bringing you up to speed on what happened in those quarterfinals that are due to take place tonight. We'll be uh, dissecting those, reacting to those and looking ahead uh, to England's game against Ukraine as well. So lots of great football to come at the weekend. And you know what I've loved about the Euros? It's kind of given us a bit of respite from all the transfer noise. 
Um, and I'm looking forward to it returning for a couple of days uh, before we get a couple of days off again. But I'll catch you all tomorrow. Until then, take care. Enjoy your Friday and enjoy your weekend. Ciao. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.